Hello, builders. It is our privilege to welcome you to this episode of the Build Your Success podcast. I'm Brian Brogen, your host. You know we like to build you so you can build others. We do that through our coaching, training, and speaking events, but we also do that through guests we bring to the podcast. I'm excited today to have Jim Letzring on the podcast. He is the branch vice president for the Neville Group. So welcome to the podcast today, Jim. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Nice to see you again. Awesome. And would you introduce our audience first to you and then secondly to the Neville Group? So, yeah, you, you explained it. Um, my name is Jim Letzring. I work for the Neville Group. I run the uh, San Diego branch for the Neville Group. Um, we are a top 50 contractor, especially subcontractor in the U.S. We're located in California primarily with offices in San Diego, home office in the L.A. area offices in San Francisco. And then we just recently, about a year and a half ago, opened an office in Las Vegas. Congratulations. And prior to us beginning the recording here, you shared with me that y'all are celebrating celebrating your 20th anniversary this year. Congratulations. Well, thank you. And I, I may be a year off. Um, boy, time flies. When, when you get to be my age, Brian, it, things are going very rapidly. So it might have been last year, but uh, yeah, we, we definitely a significant... Uh, uh, event for us in, in our company's history. It's unique because uh, when Michael Neville first started this company, he just wanted to do probably $15 million a year. And this year we'll do in excess of 300 million. So um, quite, quite the growth for our company. It really is. And to hear that kind of growth, I want to ask you this question. We ask all of our guests, what does leadership and being a leader mean to Jim lecturing? Well, um, I think it's multifaceted. Um, you ha have to wear a lot of different hats because you're dealing with a lot of different personalities. Um, every client is a little bit different. Um, so you, you have to lead that way as well. But for, from, for me, um, it's understanding what your people are looking for. It's understanding what their needs are. And, and it doesn't mean you give them everything they want, but you help them achieve their goals by, by setting standards, by setting metrics to, to help them achieve where they want to be. So I, I think leadership can change for day-to-day -day operations. Um, I mean, there, there's so, sometimes tough loves required, but often more times than not, we, we want to make sure that, you know, we're, we're giving them the tools to succeed and, and, you know, making sure that this is a home for them as well. I mean, you know, manpower is hard to find across the board from both a, uh, a field standpoint, as well as an office standpoint. So again, it's giving them tools to, to succeed and make sure that they're, you know, understanding what the company goals are. That's great. You began the conversation with understanding what their needs are, giving them the tools, which is part of that, some tough love, all of those things. You know, I've learned that leadership and being a leader are different to different people. And, and it takes some change. It takes some being agile and, and understanding that different people have different needs. So really enjoy that. Let's talk about, you talked about how hard it is to get people in the field, get people in the office and the construction industry. What are the opportunities that are available to those that are looking for a career? Maybe they're coming out of college, coming out of high school, or they're transitioning from another career. Why would they want to come to the construction industry? Well, it's one of the largest industries in the world. Um, without construction, everything around you, you, you wouldn't see. I mean, it's kind of a funny topic that you bring up because I was just talking about this with a friend over the weekend and, and they had mentioned that their friend's son is a welder and just loves, loves his profession. Um, come from a community where college education is very promoted. Um, and, and don't get me wrong, I, I'm all for education, but I think a true education comes when you get into the construction industry. Um, there is so many different opportunities from, from being that laborer in the field to, to the one who's actually getting the work put in place to, to having a career in the office where you're, you're doing the management style of things. And, and you know, I think you can do both successfully without having to have that four-year degree. There's so many positions available right now, and every market you look at and every market that we're in, um, manpower in the field is very, very tough to find. Um, 
we're going to peak probably around 1,100 guys in the field, guys and girls in the field this year. And um, it's hard to find that, that qualified labor. Sometimes you're, you're not, you're just kind of filling a void instead of actually having that A and B player put, put work into place. And that's not any fault of the employee um, because they, they, they just want to make a living and do what they can. But, um, but the opportunity itself is so grand in our industry and, and not just my trade, but every trade across the board, electricians, HVAC. I mean, there's so much work out there to be had and, and people can make a very good career being in the construction industry. And, and I think sometimes it may not seem as glamorous as a doctor or, or, or an engineer, but the construction industry has treated a lot of people very well. Um, it's provided for my family and um about a year and a half ago, my son came into the construction industry as well, um, doing the same path that I started off. And, and he um, absolutely loves what he's doing. So I think construction across the board offers such an opportunity that I think oftentimes gets overlooked. It most certainly does. And as you alluded to, for decades, the emphasis was going to college and learning you know, institutionally. And it, that's a great, that's one way to learn. But the other way to learn is on, a, as you alluded to, on a job site or in another type of skills oriented trade that where you can earn a living. I like to tell folks that you can earn why you learn as opposed to stacking up college debt. So it's just another opportunity. We're not we're not degrading people that go to college. We don't think we're it's the competition between either one of us, but it is a different way to, to do things. I, in fact, barely graduated high school. College was not an option for me. And I stumbled upon a very rewarding career in construction. And, and today, you know, I just like to encourage people to consider it as an option. If I could add on to that, Brian, if you don't mind. So just a little history on me. So I started off at a four-year school. Um, I knew I wanted to be an architect. That, that was my goal. Um, quickly into that process, I realized that's not for me. I, I do not want to sit behind a desk all day. I went to a smaller trade school. Um, they taught me the foundation, but it wasn't until I started the on-the-job on training. I took the last semester off to, to go work for an, an employer to um, provide on-the-job training. And it wasn't until then that the light really, really went off. And I realized this is, this is my career. This is what I want to do because I'd learned so much in that three, four months of uh, just on-hand training. Um, schoolwork was great, but being actually in, in the mess of things was fantastic. That's great. And that leads me to another thing. You know, when I was in school, high school, they, they threatened me with digging ditches and lo and behold, that's what I've done. However, our, the construction industry has changed. Technology has advanced. A lot of ditch digging today is done by an equipment operator that makes really good money uh, that, you know, can, can compete with jobs that have college educations. So let's talk about technology and construction, how that's changed in your career, and then what you're seeing the future. I mean, I think the next decade's really going to transform the construction industry. I would agree. Um, technology, and you mentioned being a ditch digger, a lot of that's probably done by GPS now with the heavy equipment. And um, same, same thing in our industry. Um, you're, you're seeing automated layout tools that uh, you, you're you work through the, the Revit model, um, plug it into a system, and you've got this little robot running around a floor laying out your walls for you, um, talking about just different technologies of how to build studs. I mean, 20 years ago, walking through a job site, there was cords everywhere on the ground and being safety hazards, trip hazards. I mean, just different hazards of all that debris being around. Then they went to cordless screw guns. Um, just every every year we're seeing something a little bit different, just the BIM modeling that, that goes into it until probably seven to 10 years ago, drywallers never, never used BIM on a project. We never had to model a project because it was all about the MEP trades. Now we're, we're fully engaged early on in a project to make sure that we're coordinating with the MEP trades to, to make sure that there's no interference in the walls. So just 
in the last 10 years, things have exploded to, to something that I'd never fathomed 20, 25 years ago. And it's, it's, it's an exciting time to be in our business. And I mean, our foremans aren't using, aren't using paper plans anymore. Everything's on an iPad or a tablet. And I mean, to, to go to a detail, you just tap a detail on the tablet and it automatically jumps you to that page. So there's so many things that have sped up our industry and enhanced our industry. Um, like you said, in, in the next 10 to 20 years, I, I'm just excited to see what happens because I, my mind is blown over the last 10 years. I'm with you there, Jim. In fact, I think about when I first started, you know, we'd set elevations with a transit and a story pole. Uh, and I, I remember, you know, those old story poles that were intense and, you know, I had always worked in, in fractions. And so there's just some mistakes made between the fractions and the tenths. But today, and, and in fact, you know, 20 years ago, I was dumbfounded about when the laser level came out and, and we could shoot elevations with, with beep, 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 <laughs> as opposed to, you know, two people do it, doing that. You could narrow that down to one person doing, doing grades. So, and then, and the next thing, you know, I was at an industry meeting recently and they showed what appeared to be a robot dog, four legged thing. And this, robot was doing site inspections with the BIM model to do progress completion inspections. And I was dumbfounded. I was like, you know what? That's different than an inspector that's got some experience and knowledge coming out and kind of, you know, figuring it out with his intuition or her intuition. But this robot is actually scanning the model and doing real true percentage completions on linear footage and square and does it in such fast times with so much data that that, that just dumbfounded me. And, and I realized what other potentials are. In fact, you know, for a long time, we've had a lot of problem with getting people's skills developed, workforce development. And I see some of this technology helping with that, where, you know, somebody that's doing layout and fitting depends on the model, not on their own knowledge and skills. They still, they have to learn to use the technology. And I think that's also creating some opportunities for young people that enjoy the, the more technical stuff. Uh, as opposed to the the trades that we that we can in, bring into the industry and and they can learn and and help help us with that. Exactly. The, this layout this layout unit I was talking about is basically I mean run through BIM, but then then you've got a guy with a remote control just kind of running that. And, and whereas you might be able to lay out four hundred feet a day manually, this thing is laying out sixteen to two thousand feet a day man, annually. So. It, it, it's um, it's very unique positions that we're in, and, and I have seen that robot dog that you've talked about. It hasn't been used on any of our projects as of yet that I'm aware of, but yeah, it, it's right around the corner. It's yeah, fascinating. I I know there are many rewards in the construction industry. One of the things that I love is is seeing things come to fruition. You know, taking a greenfield site digging a footer, building a building, doing interior and, and somebody using that space. So it's very rewarding. But I also encourage people to make, you know, new recruits aware of the challenges associated with our industry. It's hard work. It, it's, it's labor intensive. It's hot. We got environments. We got cold. We, you know, all everything that can happen happens at a job site. And many times we have to work away from home because the projects are not in our backyard. So what are some of the challenges that you see in the construction industry, just to be transparent? Well, I brought it up earlier is manpower and the lack thereof. Again, construction really isn't that glamorous um, profession that it really should be. And, and therefore, because it's not, people are looking away from that, thinking that's someone else's problem, someone else will take care of that. So right for us out here, and I think it's pretty universal, across the board is the manpower shortage. Um, but to your point, there are other challenges that go along with the construction industry. Um, so when the recessions hit, construction is one of the first um, industries to hit. So I, I mentioned that my son is in the industry. I kind of discouraged him because there is a lot of pressure. When, when, when you have some down and lean times, there's, there's pressure where you're going to get that next job, how you're going to win that next bid. Um, things are competitive. The schedules that we're facing now are much more rapid than they ever have been. I mean, our commitments that we make to our 
our trade partners, our, our, our general contracting partners and our owners is much greater than it ever has in the past. It hasn't been in the past. And a lot of that is due to technology. Things are faster. Um, we were able to get things put in place faster because of technology. So therefore, you, you um, lose some of that window that you've had in times past. There's some risks with that as well, though. When you're th doing things so fast, um, mistakes can happen. Um, rework might be required. And, and, you know, it can be some safety issues as well because you've got so many different trades working in the same general vicinity that something has got to give. So between between the schedule impacts, between uh, manpower shortages, that's probably the two biggest things that we face. And then just being on top of technology. We, we talked briefly about technology earlier, but if you're not on the forefront of technology, if you're not looking forward and making sure that um, you're doing everything you can to be on that cusp uh, of, of being the leader in the industry, you're going to be left behind. And so one thing we are very focused on here at Neville is ensuring that we, we've got people looking for technology. We have people come in and, and give us seminars just so we understand what's out there. Doesn't mean that we're necessarily going to use that, but we want to be understanding of what's happening out in the industry. And again, be on the forefront because if we're not, we're, we're going to you're either growing or you're dying. So we want to be growing. And uh, we, we think we're doing a pretty good job of that. That is so true. And as you're alluding to that technology and the advancement in scheduling software and those things, the float that we used to have in schedules has really disappeared. And it does bring some of those challenges with, with the speed, you know, sometimes accuracy, some accuracy, sometimes safety. We just got to be conscious and aware of those things and mitigate those risks. I, I tell people all the time, you know, we used to wait on the drawings because they had to be produced and printed. And now they say, oh, it's in your inbox. So, you know, the drawings are there. It's like, oh boy, how it's, it's a new, new world we live in. And, and we, we have to mitigate those things. But on I, the plus well, side of that, on the plus side of that though, Brian, I mean, and that's a great example. I mean, the drawings are right there at your fingertips. I remember having to, um, post all the RFIs on drawings and, and make sure that the, the guys had that. So it, if there was multiple foremen on a project, you're, you're posting RFIs on all these drawings and getting it to turn over to the foreman. Now it's all on their iPad. I mean, the RFIs automatically get posted. There's no reason for missing it. Does some things get missed? Of course, we're all human, but it, it has made information, the, the transfer of information so much easier. Yeah, and everybody being on the same page, that, that's, that's, that's what that technology has helped with, without a doubt. Yes. During my show prep, I, I reviewed some of your LinkedIn posts and your company's LinkedIn posts, and I saw you individually and the Neville Group recognizing employees. Tell me why it's important to recognize employees. Employees are our backbone. I mean, without, without our employees, we definitely would not be able to do the kind of work we do be able to pursue the kind of work we do um, or, or, or just exist. Um, you, you consider that the people that you are with day in and day out at work, you're with them probably more than you are your family. And um, it's important to recognize work well done. I think it's important to, to recognize where improvement is required as well, but if you're not recognizing your employees, someone else is going to be recognizing them. And, and again, it's, it's all about retaining, retaining and, and keeping them excited to be working with you, keep them engaged. And, and it's a pretty simple act to recognize someone for doing a, a good deed. And, and I don't think it gets done enough. I, I know I'm guilty of not doing it enough, but it's something that I'm trying to work on and make, make myself better in that arena. But again, without them, we wouldn't exist. And, and that goes from, from everyone in the office to everyone in the field. And when I'm walking a job, I, I try to acknowledge everyone. I'm, I'm not going to know everyone's name. Uh, and I, I wish I could be better at that. But I am going to stop and talk and just check in and see how people are doing because I want them to know that they are important because they are. And, and it, it's... 
it's like I said earlier, it, it's a very simple act to do to recognize people. And I think we all need to probably do a better job at that. That is so true, Jim, that we need to do a better job of it. In fact, surveys show employees desire feedback and recognition is such a great way to give them feedback. I like to say what gets recognized gets repeated. Uh, so when you're, when you're encouraging people and you're giving them that positive recognition, they're going to say, you know what, Jim, my, my executive likes this. I'm going to do more of this because that's, that's like, I got that positive feedback from, from them. Awesome. Awesome way to conduct business. And as you alluded to, let's encourage people to do more of it. Absolutely. Well, that is the end of our podcast. I want to thank you for joining me today on the build your success podcast, Jim, and what you and the Neville group are, are doing is amazing. I want to thank our listeners for listening to the podcast today. Do me a favor, go to wherever you're listening to this podcast, give us an honest review and rating and share this podcast with others. Remember to build yourself and then build others.